All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the measuring line tonight. We are starting a new chapter in this podcast where we're going to be talking about revivalists. You have been impacted by revivalists. Yes, you have. You've been impacted by men and women who were brazen, who were bold, who had this great level of faith. People that in some ways have gone down in infamy to some and and were real famous to others. And so we're going to discover as we go on this journey that there are people, there are men and women who really set the stage for what you're experiencing today that some had to push through into belief because sometimes what happens is God does something new and then what happens is we turn it into a religious thing. And so people throughout history, whenever God does something, they tend to want to tame it, control it, make it about this or that, put a denomination on it, but then God busts busts through with some new revelation, some new type of thing that's really always been there, but it seems new to us because we haven't really went after it. But but then there are these people, these revivalists that do, and they shake up their communities. They shake up the world as we know it. And so tonight we are talking about Mariah Woodworth Etter. Let me say it again. Mariah Woodworth Etter. I don't know if you heard of her, but she's been really influential, very influential woman. And some people, if you heard of her, you might have heard of her as... Maria Woodworth Etter, and that's not really how you say her name. Her name is spelled as Maria, but it's actually pronounced as Mariah, as Mariah. And so you might have heard of her before as Maria Woodworth Etter, but just so you know, it's Mariah. And so people switch back and forth between how they pronounce her name, that type of thing. But we're talking about Mariah Woodworth Etter, and before we get into that. Let me just tell you how you can help me out. Share. Share the broadcast. Tag some people and invite people to this. Let them know that we're talking about revivalists. There is revival in the air. And I'm not talking about in a sense of like it's here or it's there. But God's really putting a revival heart in in his people. That we're looking for, okay, where's the latest revival? Is it going to be here? Is it going to be there? But I really get a sense that God is sparking revival in the hearts of individuals. That yes... Revival is coming in sort of a massive way, but it's also coming into individuals here and there that are sparking things in their family, right? Sparking things at their jobs, sparking things on social media like this. That is no longer just about what's the big move, but but people are catching revival in their heart and God's stirring people to see the kingdom of God manifest right where they are. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You're probably one of those people that are listening to me tonight, that God's been stirring revival in your heart for you to see new things, for you to pursue God's kingdom, for you to step into alignment with the Holy Spirit so that your will won't be done, but his will will be done. And so tag, share, invite people to this. There are people that want revival, revival stirring within people. Number two, you can give to my ministry. There's a pinned comment right there on how you can go to my website and you can actually sow into my ministry if you feel so led and then do leave something something in the comments i like when people talk to me i'm one of those interactive type preachers if you leave me a comment or a question i might respond back to it all right and so when it comes to revivalists <clears throat> there are certain markers there are certain identifications that we can look for what makes a revivalist and i'm not saying that this is like set in stone i'm not saying that you can look for one particular scripture but as I've been studying different revivalists from the history of the church, there are certain identifying markers, all right? So when we're talking about revivalists, we're primarily talking about apostles, prophets, and evangelists. Apostles, prophets, and evangelists. People that 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 spread the gospel, people that spread the, the kingdom manifestation, people that have new revelation. That when we look at the, the, the revivalists of the, of, of the church, what we discover is that they were helmed, they are spearheaded typically by apostles, prophets, and evangelists. And so what are some of the markers? Before we get into Mariah Woodworth Eder, what are some of the markers of someone who is a revivalist? And in some ways, really, what we're saying is a reformer as well. Okay, number one, and it's in no particular order, it's prayer. Absolutely, it's prayer. When I study these revivalists, at the, at the heart of everything they do, at the heart of everything they pursue, it begins and ends with prayer. 
You have got to be a person of prayer if you are called to be a revivalist. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is Luke 5, verse 16, where it says, Jesus often, listen to this, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Listen to that again. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places. And what did he do? He prayed. This was often for Jesus. He did this on the regular. He was consistent about it. He constantly went to prayer. That when you look at the revivalists, they are the kinds of people that pray without ceasing. That's why Paul said that. Paul understood, the apostle Paul understood, that his ministry was not going to be marked by persuasive speech, but by demonstration of the Spirit's power. So he would always be a person of prayer. He was always crying out to God. The revivalists, their heart, their greatest joy, their greatest pastime, if you will, their greatest time of all times is when they get into prayer. You have got to be a person of prayer if you think you're going to start revival. If you think that you're going to start a reformation, you're going to have to do it with God. It can't be by persuasive speech. It can't be by money. It can't be by who you know. It can't be because you have the personality, the strength, the connections, the, the triumphant appeal in your life, right? It can't be by any of those man-made things. Revivalists, they know that in order to make an impact on the community, in order to follow God, I have to be a person of prayer. You're not a revivalist if prayer still feels like a chore for you. That one of the things I often ask people that when they're when they're seeking leadership, when they're seeking influence over people, there's questions that I tend to ask. And I don't always ask them right away because I want people sort of just to feel their way in. But one of the things I'll ask somebody when they're looking to be like a leader, okay? And not just like someone who is over a certain particular ministry or just wants to serve, but if you really want influence over people, the first question that you have to answer is, are you a person of prayer? And then it goes beyond that. It's not just prayer, but had you gotten to the place of prayer where it's no longer a chore, where it's not a struggle, you're looking forward to prayer. You're not just praying because I'm a Christian and I should pray. I'm a Christian and I want to do a ministry. I have to pray because I'm a No, 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 no. You love prayer. You love spending time with God. That if you really are called to apex visionary leadership, you're going to spearhead a revival. You're going to spearhead some great ministry. If that is what you're called to do, prayer, listen to me, it's no longer a chore for you. It's your daily bread along with the word of God. It's, it's your source. It's, it's something you rejoice and you love spending time in prayer. And here's the thing. The more time you spend in prayer, watch me, the less you actually want to be seen. <laughs> when you look at these revivals, I'm telling you, as we go forward from, from this night to the next night, what you're going to understand is that these revivalists, they really want God more than anything. And because they want God, God says, I'm going to put you out in front now. Because you want me so badly that the people, what they'll see is me through you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That prayer, deep prayer, not the prayer that still feels like a chore to you. Not the prayer that you're doing because someone told you to pray. Right? Not, not the Bible reading you're doing because someone said, you know, you're not reading your Bible. But, but these men and women, these revivalists, they would pray, they would read the scripture, and then they would pray. Guess what? They would read the scripture, and then they would pray and keep on reading the scripture to the point, watch this, that they became like John the Baptist, that I must decrease so that he may increase. And when you begin to decrease in prayer, then God increases in you and he says, you know what? I'm going to put you in front of the world. I'm going to put you in front of this community. I'm going to put you in front of these kinds of people because people now see me in you because you're dead to self. Sweetheart, if you still have pride, if there's anger in you, if you're trying to prove a point, if you can't really get along with people, if you're frustrated all the time, if you don't really have a prayer life, if you don't really read the word, if, if prayer still feels like a chore for you, then you're not called to spearhead a ministry just yet. Woo! Now, I just got to say that. I got to say that. Because prayer is that thing that gets you to the place to where you decrease so that he can increase. And so these revivalists, I'm telling you, one of the identifiable markers of, of a revivalist is they have a heart for prayer. No one has to tell them to pray. They know it. They do it. 
and they're happy to pray. They love spending time with God. Can I just broaden this out real fast and, and, and tell you something? I don't want God to say to me when I meet him that I tore the veil in two so that you can, you know, come and spend time with me, but you didn't want to do that. There's a lot of, listen, listen, a lot of, listen, listen to me. There is a lot of ministry going on. There are a lot of people pursuing, casting out demons and, and the prophetic and, and serving somewhere or, or wanting to do this in their community, whatever the case may be. And yet prayer still feels like a chore for them. You cannot do the ministry of Jesus without actually wanting, truly wanting to connect with the source of ministry, to connect with Jesus just because you love him, just because you love him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If prayer feels like a chore, like something you have to do because you're a Christian and your pastor's telling you to do it, then you really need to ask yourself, should you, should you be spearheading any type of ministry? These revivalists, they understood it. That if God is going to shake up my community, it will be because I spent time with him and only he will get the credit. It won't be me running off of my pride. It won't be me running off of my insecurity. It won't be me trying to prove a point. And what we will discover too, watch this, as we talk about some of these revivalists, I'm not going to say names right now, but, but, but when they begin to fall, it's because they, they stopped thinking it was all God. It's because some of them, watch this, they got political. There's a particular revivalist in my head right now. He got really political. He started to believe the hype of the people. People were clamoring for him to become some type of political figure. He pursues it, gets into office, and he loses the anointing. Because he forgot that all this, what I'm doing, these miracles, all that stuff, it comes from God. Revivalists, they love prayer. It's not a chore. It's not an obligation. It is their lifestyle. The revivalists, if I were to put it into like a sentence, they would say, how could I go a day without prayer? How could I go a a another, another two hours without prayer? Four, are you hearing what I'm saying? They pray and they pray and they pray. And so I really want to differentiate that. Listen to me. I really want to differentiate that because there are some people that pray and it's always petition, petition, petition. This is what I want, God. Come on, God. You're not doing this, God. God, I'm angry. God, I'm upset. God, I just want you to do this. And you know, they're praying sometimes and it's just like a chore. Okay, and that's prayer. Listen, we bring our needs to God. He's, he, he's our father, right? But then there are other people that yes, they bring up their needs to God, but prayer doesn't feel like a chore. It's not just petitioning God. They lavish his presence. They love him. They enjoy him. Sometimes they, 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 they might tell someone, I can't, I can't go out tonight because I'm going to spend time with God. That's who the revivalists are. They decrease, and then he increases. And God says, you come to the forefront. You go to this community and start something new. You go to this community and bring signs, wonders, and miracles because I will get the credit because you have decreased in prayer. You're not a revivalist if you don't have a heart for prayer. And I always question leaders, people wanting, I'm talking like leadership over people, directing people type ministry. I question people that struggle to pray. Because if you want leadership over people, then, then what's going to fuel you, fuel you without God is going to be your pride, your own sense of self-importance. No, you have to die. That's why Paul said, I die daily. Woo! He died, died daily. In other words, I kill Saul of Tarsus every day so that Paul the apostle can do ministry. I kill him every day. Jacob has to die every day so that Israel can come forth. And so one of the identifying markers, and I, and I labor that because it's the truth. It's the truth for revivalists, and it's true for every Christian. Revivalists, one of the identifying markers is this propensity for prayer, long-suffering in prayer. Stay there until something breaks. They don't just get through a prayer. They pray through some things. And so number one is prayer. And this is in no particular order. Number two is they have a lot of antagonists. Woo, as we start getting into these revivalists, what you're going to see is that they have a lot of people that do not like them. And unfortunately, it doesn't just come from the secular world. It comes from the saints. As a matter of fact, even this revivalist we're talking about tonight, Mariah, she has another revivalist that comes against her. His name is Jonathan Dowie. 
And, and we're going to talk about him down the road. He's a, he's a great revivalist. But even he, he comes against Mariah Woodworth at Etter. They have disagreements. And yet they're both doing great things for God, for God. And so these revivalists, they tend to have church folk, religious folk, people that don't want to change, people that want to do it one way. They get upset with them. Nehemiah was a revivalist. He was a reformer. He hears about the, the wall of Jerusalem being torn down. He, he investigates it, right? He prayed about it, right? What did he do? He prays to God about it. He, he inspects the wall. And, and as he begins to rebuild the wall, right, all of a sudden, Sambalit, Tobiah, and Gesh, Geshem come out the lurch somewhere, somewhere out of the cut, and they start to criticize the work that he and the builders are doing. These revivalists, they, they have death threats. People, people some of them... Um, some of them were actually poisoned, but God brought them back to life, right? All These revivalists have all sorts of people come against them because they're trying to do something new. They're breaking down demonic strongholds in certain areas. They're, they're pushing new, forth new revelation. And so the revivalists, they always have great antagonists. I'm talking about, listen, this isn't just like somebody got your coffee wrong at at Starbucks or something, and now your your feelings are hurt because your your Starbucks's coffee wasn't right. This isn't somebody cutting you off down the street, and you feel like you're suffering for Jesus because somebody cut you off on the street. This isn't like you know people don't like you. Somebody unfriended you on on social media. People ghosted you, and they act like you don't don't exist. I'm talking about they have some real antagonists. That you, let me get nerdy real fast. Batman. <laughs> One of the reasons, you, you want to know why people think Batman is such an interesting, interesting superhero? It's because of the Joker. That one of the, the, the thoughts is that what makes Batman so great is because the Joker is a really great villain. And the Joker brings out the best in Batman, and Batman brings out the worst in the Joker. Right? That because of the Batman's righteous loyalty to things, and he's a little messed up too, now the Joker... He has to, like, usurp, try to overthrow Batman, all that stuff. They're constantly trying to one-up one another. That Batman, the reason why people like Batman so much, I'm Batman, <laughs> is because the Joker is such a great villain. It works really well to see them go at it. And what happens with these revivalists, they are so anointed. They have such great faith. They're, like, unmovable. When you're around a revivalist, I mean, they are, they are, they set their face like flint. This is what must be done. Because they're so unmovable, people get mad at them. Antagonists come out of nowhere. Villains show up everywhere to try to stop them because they're trying to do something for God. I mean, just think about Jesus. He, you know, when he's born, people are looking to kill him as a child. Even Moses. People were trying to kill Moses when he was a child. Thousands of babies were killed in search of Moses and Jesus when they were kids because of the great deliverance they would bring. In one sense, listen to me, in one sense, the revivalists, they are a deliverance worker, not just in the expelling of demons, but the expelling of, uh, of, of territorial thoughts and, and, and schemes and ways and workings of the church and within environments. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They come and they just bring deliverance holistically to everything that they do. And you're going to see as we go, actually, how one revivalist inspired another revivalist. I might talk a little bit about that tonight. So number one, one of the identifiable markers of a revivalist is prayer. You cannot get away from this. Every revivalist that I've studied, what I see is that they have this dominant prayer life. I mean, it just dominates their life, prayer. Number two, they tend to have great antagonists. I'm talking haters. I mean, they have this brilliant light. And the good thing about light is that it attracts good people. That when there's a light, people tend to go towards the light because they want to see. And sometimes you get warmed up by the light. But light also attracts mosquitoes. And so the revivalists, while, the, while their light is shining so brightly, there are also mosquitoes that show up that want to suck the life out of them or, or see what they can benefit from them. Right, but not be so connected. Is that's one of the things that you see is that the, the revivalists sometimes people would show up and and they act like they're supporting them, but really they're just trying to use them for an opportunity, and then they turn on them, 
And so the revivalists, they attracted good people because, because of their light shining so brightly, right? But then they also attract mosquitoes. And we're going to see that even with what we talk about tonight. Number three, identifying marker, anointing. And I'm going to go quickly. I'm not going to spend much more time on this. I'm going to keep going forward here. But they're anointed. The anointing breaks the yoke. One of the ways that I test my own, own anointing is that I want to see people get better spiritually. I want to see people want to have a prayer life now. I want to see people's character. When people get their, their feathers ruffled a little bit around me and, and they start changing for the better, I start to say, the anointing's working. The anointing breaks the yoke. It doesn't just get you shaking, throwing you into a tizzy, you speaking in tongues, you wanting to prophesy. If your character isn't changing, if you're not becoming more like Jesus, if you're not giving up those old habits and, and following Christ, that's not anointing. That's just something tickling your flesh for a little bit. That's just something, an experience that you had, but it didn't bring life change to you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? True anointing, it breaks the yoke of slavery. You begin to change. You get different. At my church, I'm telling you this as the truth. Uh, this is the truth, and people will tell you this, and it has everything to do with the anointing. It has everything to do with Jesus himself. It takes about two to three months, and people start changing at my church. People can show up, and, and I was following God at this level, but then when I got here, I started to think differently. I thought I had it right here, but now I'm realizing that maybe I should be doing this. Right? All of a sudden, the anointing breaks the yoke. People's character becomes more like Jesus. And that's what happens in these revivalist meetings. That what happens is not only are there signs, wonders, and miracle, miracles, but the anointing is such that people actually give their lives to Christ. Come on. They, 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 they rend their hearts and not just their garments. When it's true revival, repentance happens. And not just repentance towards salvation, but repentance in terms of mind change. That you can be a believer and you are going one way. And you thought that that was the right way. And all of a sudden, God goes, boom. And you go, well, I need to start doing this now. <laughs> and I'm telling you, at, at my church that God has allowed me through his grace to be the pastor of, I see that happen all the time. God, God, the, the anointing hits, and it's like, boom. And then people ha start changing. People start changing, changing. That happened to me even when the church got started, right? <laughs> I'm the church planning pastor, and there were ways in which I thought I knew what I was doing. And then God just changed me because the anointing breaks the yoke. He changed the way, it was maybe year two or year three, he just changed my focus on how to, how to plant his church and what to do. And so the anointing breaks the yoke. When a revivalist is there, listen, they are anointed. And things begin to change. Number four, identifying marker, they have great faith. Great, 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 great faith. While everybody else is looking for, like, what do people normally do in this situation? Okay, what can I rely on in the past? Okay, well, this is how I do things, and I think that we should do it this way. While everybody else is trying to add faith, listen to me carefully, trying to add faith to what they already have confidence in. Come on, trying to add faith into what they already know is a sure thing, trying to add faith into something that men typically do. While people are doing that, the revivalist is not trying to add faith to something that they already know is going to work, but they really have faith. Look, we're going to sit here. Do you know what's going to happen? No, I don't know what's going to happen, but God's going to do it. They have the faith of like a Moses who shows up to the Red Sea after telling people of this great promised land, and people might begin to criticize. People might begin to look down and say, you don't know what you're talking about. But the revivalist says, look, this Red Sea is going to part. I'm telling you it's going to part. I'm, t I'm telling you it's going to part. Can, can you imagine? Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine Joshua telling the Israelites, look, we're going to walk around this city called Jericho. And then when I tell you to shout, the walls are going to fall. Can you imagine? Like, what type of faith is that? What type of, like, that's crazy faith. That's dynamic faith. To do something that strange. The revivalists, they are marked by great faith. They believe God like Abraham. Even though Abraham was old, right? He was old. He believed God and it was credit to him as, right, as righteousness. And so let me go through those again. Then we're going to jump right into Moriah. I just wanted to give you those. There's more, but these are typically, when I look at the revivalists, these are four things that really mark them. They're people of prayer. They have a lot of enemies. They, they, they are anointed, and they have great faith. And so let's go to Mariah Woodworth Eder. Part of the reason why I chose this lady is because she's from my block. 
She's from my neck of the world, neck of the woods. Okay. She's from Ohio. Okay. She's from Lisbon, Ohio. She was born in 1844. She became saved at the age of 13. And when she was a teenager, she knew that God was calling her. She could feel Jesus speaking to her. Sometimes she would, sometimes she would hear God speaking and saying, I'm calling you out to the fields to the highways, go everywhere to gather my lost sheep. She would hear Jesus. She would feel Jesus telling her these things when she was a teenager. I want you to go out there and gather my lost sheep. And so I actually looked it up. Lisbon, Ohio is actually two and a half, like two hours and 44 minutes from where I grew up at, Columbus, Ohio. And so I'm beginning to realize, like, man, when I was looking at the map, I was thinking, man, I, I know how to get there. She, she's not that far from this town or, 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 or that city. But that's where she grew up at, all right? And she got saved as a 13-year-old kid. And I, I like the connection for me personally because I got saved when I was 12 years old. It's sort of fun to, to, to look at other people's story and see how, you know, your life, what God did in their life. And so I, I feel connected to a degree because she's from Ohio and she got saved at 13, and I was 12 years old when I got saved. But more importantly, the reason why I'm bringing her up tonight is not just because I feel connected in terms of where she grew up, Ohio, all that type of stuff. But I really feel like, listen to, listen to me, I really felt this before I got on here earlier today, okay? And even when I knew earlier, in, earlier last week, when I knew I was going to be talking about Mariah, Woodworth Edder, I knew this was going to be for somebody. I, I truly believe, listen to me, I truly believe you're either, you're either listening to me now or you're going to be watching the replay. I truly believe there's a woman listening to me and she has the same anointing as Mariah Woodworth Edder. I could have picked any revivalist. I could have picked an, an easier one. I could have picked a more well-known one. I chose Mariah because somebody right now, there's a woman who needs to hear this because you carry, you carry this spirit. You, you carry what this woman has, and it's been in you. And as, and as I begin to bring up right here at the beginning her struggles, you're going to see that, that her struggle is your struggle for why you have not, listen to me, why you have not been obedient to the Lord. And I'm not saying that you have to go the exact same path as her, that you need to start doing tent revival and all that stuff like that, like we're going to get to here shortly. But what I am saying is you carry that same spirit, and God wants you to begin to to, to operate because there's something holding you back. I'm going to get to that in a moment. But understand, when you look at the spirit of Elijah, first of all, Elijah had it right. And then that spirit went to who? Elisha, his understudy. And then you go to the New Testament. And who was it that had the spirit of Elijah? It was John the Baptist, right? Come through, Buckeyes. That's right, Ja Ru Gambian. <laughs> we Buckeye fans in my house. But, uh, you know, the spirit of Elijah was with Elijah and went to Elisha and then it went to John the Baptist. And they all were a little bit different. Do you see what I'm saying? And so what I'm trying to say to you is there's a woman listening to me. And it could be more than one. But I know for sure there's a woman listening to me. And you have this spirit. It might come out differently. But you're going to relate to this woman as I begin to delve into her life and tell you some more about her. And particularly, it's going to be her struggles that are getting you, that, that, that you're going to recognize with. You're going to identify with some of her struggles and what's keep, keeping you back. And so understand, while she had this desire, this, this call from God about going out to the fields and going out to the highways and going everywhere, she heard Jesus tell her that. While she had that desire, she struggled. Why did she struggle? Because it's 1844, y'all, and she's a woman. She's a woman. She's a woman. Woman couldn't even vote yet, right? Let alone preach. And so she's struggling with this idea because she's a woman. She's not going to be embraced. She's not going to be accepted. How do I fulfill this call when I feel like my womanliness in a society, you know, like this doesn't, doesn't accept me? Right, My woman in this won't be accepted behind a pulpit. It won't be accepted. But watch, for some reason in the Christian church, we love to send women on the mission field. Okay, And so as she gets older, she thinks, I'm, I'm too scared to start my own ministry. I, I can't preach that the pulpit is for a man. And so I can just, you know, I can prepare myself to go on the mission field. And as she's getting that all together, what happens is her father dies. Her father dies while working in a field. And so instead of going on the mission field, 
she goes back home to, to live with her family, to support her family because her father has now died. All right? And so she comes home to support the, the family, and she settles for the normal Christian life. How many of you know that a revivalist can't be normal? A revivalist can't settle for the status quo, can't settle for nominal Christianity. And so she says to herself, I'm going to settle for a normal Christian lifestyle. And so watch this. Even though she knew that God was calling her to be a revivalist, to, do, to, to go everywhere and preach the gospel, to, to do meetings, she compromises in the sense that she thinks, well, not, number one, I'm a woman. And then, then she thinks, I'll just go on the mission field. Right? I'll just, go on, I'll just go on the mission field. And then she comes home and says, well, I'll just settle for a normal life. And so what does she do? What does that normal life entail? Well, as she keeps getting a little bit older, she eventually gets married. And she, she settles down and she's trying to just have, you know, the basic Christian life with, with kids and a husband. She married a man by the name of P.H. Woodworth. That's how she gets her, her last name. Now, obviously, it's going to change, right? Because there's a hyphen there, Wood, Woodworth Etter. But she, she marries a man by the name of, of P.H. Woodworth. And she has a farm with him and they have six kids. But here's the thing. You ready? All of her kids die but one. Throughout her marriage to Mr. Woodworth, everything seems to go wrong. The finances aren't right. The, the farm isn't doing too well. Their marriage isn't doing that great. He's not really into God that much. He doesn't have a desire for ministry. And so when she would express to her husband that, hey, I, you know, what if we did ministry together, things like that, when she would express the vision for ministry, he just didn't really care all that much. And so one by one, her, her kids begin to die, except one. And not only that, but she was sickly too. She, she, she was achy in body. She didn't feel too well as well. The question is, why could it be, and I'm just, I'm just speculating here, but I want you to understand something. Could it be that she's ignoring the call of God? That because she's a woman, and in her time, she's not supposed to be a preacher. She can't even vote, right? That, that, that she just wants to go on the mission field. And, and listen, some people go on mission fields. They're not supposed to be there. You know how many Christians today? I'm about to, I'm about to get that Brian thing going now. You know how many Christians today, they, they go anywhere and do ministry, and they think that God wants them to do that? You go to where God's telling you to do, go, okay? Right? You, you, you do what God's telling you to do. And so she, she, she doesn't want to do what God's telling her to do because she's a woman. She tries to, to do ministry someplace else. I'll, I'll at least go on the mission field because they'll accept me there. She tries to have just a normal Christian life with a man that she loves, only to discover that, that the man that she's with doesn't deeply care about the things of God. Her children with the man, all of them died except one. They got, they got terrible diseases, right? Her father died. All these things begin to happen. you got to understand, listen to me, you got to understand you cannot out, outrun the will of God for your life. You cannot outrun what God wants to do in your life. That, that listen, I'm not saying that God did those things, but what I am saying is that when you step outside of the will of God, that opens the door for the devil to begin to attack you. That Jonah, you could try to run all you want, but you're gonna get swallowed up by a fish. Do you see what I'm saying? When you step outside of the will of God, that opens the door for the enemy to attack you. And so I'll never forget when I was younger, I remember being called when I was six years old to ministry. And I started reading the Bible when I, when I was six, and it was one of those Gideon Bibles. And I didn't understand it, but I remember as a six-year-old boy, I, I would be reading that Bible, trying to understand as much as much as I can. And then when I was eight years old, I remember at that time I lost my, my Gideon's Bible. I didn't have a Bible anymore, and we weren't going to church. We, we weren't a church-going family. We would, we would talk about church like cultural Christianity in America, but that's not Christianity. You know, we mentioned God, but we didn't really follow him. And we go to church on Christmas and Easter. And so, you know, um, you know, it wasn't really taught in my house. Christianity wasn't a lived out thing in my house. It was just mentioned when it was convenient. And so I remember God getting a hold of me, though, when I was younger. Even though it wasn't like really lived out in my house, God had a, had a way of getting a hold of me. And so I started reading the Bible to the best of my ability as a six-year-old. And then when I was eight years old, I lost my Gideon's Bible. And I remember having a Scooby-Doo book. And this is no joke. I had a Scooby-Doo book and I pretended like it was a Bible. And I get a box, I put it in front of me. I get 
what was my father's bathrobe. He actually was out of my life at this time, but he, he left his bathrobe behind. And so I put on the bathrobe because I saw preachers have robes on. And I put down those little pink and blue children's chairs right in front of the box. And I start preaching to my sisters. I tell my sisters to sit down in those little chairs. Here's my pulpit, this, this box. I got my preacher's robe on and I have my Scooby-Doo book. I open it up and I say, when I say God, you guys shout. So I open up my Scooby-Doo book and I go, God. And my, my sisters started going, Woo! hallelujah. Because that's how, that's how I saw church. That when we would go on Christmas or Easter or some random time, because somebody invited us, that's what I would see the preachers do. And they would preach and they would breathe heavy and they would say, oh God, ha, sha, oh God, he's going to pull you through. Ha. And that's how the preacher would preach when I was younger, the times that we would go, go, go to church. And so, so watch this, from the time I was a kid, I knew God was calling me to, to, to ministry because I didn't grow up in a household to where that was like fed in, into me. And then by the time I was 12, I got saved. Now listen, I'm going somewhere with this. Because I can relate to Mariah Woodworth's, Woodworth Edder's story. By the time I was 12, I got saved. That I can look back at 6 and 8 years old and I can see God pulling me, draw, drawing me in. At 12 years old, I get saved and I start following Jesus. I start doing evangelism everywhere I go. Just all sorts, sorts of things. And then I remember at the age of 17, I said to myself, I'm going to be a church planner. That's what I said. And it's weird. Can I explain something to y'all real fast? This happened to me like last week sometime, and it, ha it happens often to me. There are times where I'll, where I'll be in prayer, and some of you might know what I'm talking about. There are times where I will be in prayer, and I get this impression. It's like something's stuck in my throat, and I open my mouth, and I say it. And I, I say it from my own mouth, and it's what God's saying to me. I don't know if you can picture or understand what I'm saying, but I'll, I'll, literally, I'll literally be in prayer, and I'll open my mouth, and I'll say a sentence, and then I go, where did that come from? And, and, I, and I realize, oh, that was God. That's what he just said to me. Now, sometimes you hear God right through a still, uh, 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 you know, a, a still small voice. You, you, you get a vision, you get an unction or whatever. But I'm telling you that that's happened to me, happened to me sometimes. And I remember as a 17 year old kid that happening, I was in prayer. I'm reading my Bible and I'm just talking to God and I, I opened my mouth and I don't know where it came from. I just said, I'm going to start a church plant one day for God. All right. Now, watch this. I said that, and I didn't think much of it. And as I got older, I started to say things like, you know, I'm going to be a psychologist. I, I, I love the, you know, breaking down and all that type of stuff, behavioral things. So I, I'll, I thought I'd make a good psychologist or psychiatrist, something like that. You know, at one point, I thought, listen to me, at one, t at one, at one point around 18 or something years old, I thought I would be a Navy SEAL. I literally said to myself, man, I, could, I love to, I, I've, I've always liked the military. I've always been fond of it um, to, to a degree. My dad was, was in the Navy and all my, I think almost all my uncles were in some type of military. And so I thought to myself, man, I, I, I love to be a Navy SEAL. Let me, let me go, let me get in, go through the process and see if I can become a Navy SEAL. And so I had all these diff different thoughts, all these different thoughts of what, what I could do. And then eventually one thing led to another. I ended up doing ministry became a youth pastor, became a senior, I can't go through all the details, but I became a senior pastor at one point, a mental health chaplain, all this stuff. And sure enough, by the time I was 28 years old, I planted a church in Hammond, Louisiana. And all of a sudden I remembered when I was 17 years old, this came out of my mouth. Looky there. And I wasn't even trying to. By the time I was graduating seminary, I was looking to take over a church. I was just thinking, I'll go to a church, I'll, I'll, I'll renew that church. And I had all these opportunities, I, I can't go into every detail, but I had, I had mega churches that I could have taken over. I had um, medium-sized churches and all those doors shut and some of them were still open, but I felt like I was sinning if I was going to take any of those. And to make a long story short, the, the, the opportunity opened up through a mentor who spoke to me and he said, Brian, did you ever think that God wanted you to plant a church? And I said, hmm. And the moment I thought about that, I felt so much clarity like the other, the other churches, it was like, man, I could go do that. I immediate success. I know how to do that. I know how to preach in a way that people like all, all that type of stuff. But for some reason, when my mentor said, have you ever thought about planning a church? I just felt like, like, oh, like, <laughs> and so at 28 years old, we did it. We planted the church in Hammond, Louisiana. And so all of a sudden that can, that confession, confession that came out of my mouth by the Holy spirit at age 17 manifested at age 28. And I'm just thinking, that was crazy. 
because I did everything I could not to plant a church. And yet, I, are you hearing what I'm saying? I did everything I could to not be a church planner. But what I prophesied, what came out of my mouth when I was 17, manifested when I was 28 years old. And right now, I'm in Hammond, Louisiana, talking to you through a screen. And I'm still going through the church planning process. And so what I'm trying to say is this. You cannot escape the calling of God. Mariah Woodworth Eder, she figured that out. That yes, you're a woman. Yes, people think women should be on the mission field. Yes, you just, you know, you just want to settle down and have a normal Christian life. She couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. Everything went haywire. She marries a man that isn't too much into God. Her father died. Five of her kids die. All this stuff happens, okay? And again, could our disobedience open the door for the devil to attack us? The Bible seems to, seems to suggest, or actually definitely tells us that, that, that it happens. All right? And so, <clears throat> after the loss of their five children, her husband, Mr. Woodworth, he couldn't hack it anymore. Like, he just couldn't take it. Like, life was bad. Life was not going well for them, all right? Financially, the farm wasn't doing well. Uh, Mariah is sick. And when, when, the, when those five children died, the husband just became a shell of himself. There's something that happens. You know, women can go through, I'm not saying women don't go through things and they don't go through depression, but when men get depressed, they, they, they sort of really lose it. Like when, when, when a man loses purpose, when he loses destiny and he just feels like life isn't working out for him, you can just look at a man and go, man, that guy is lifeless. And that's what happened, right? Like that can happen to women, but men particularly, when their world falls apart, man, they, they hit hard. You know, especially if their world is, they feel like they have control over everything, you know. And he just felt like he lost control. He lost his passion. He lost his zeal. And so she was already married to a guy that wasn't really into Jesus. But now he doesn't have much legs underneath him anymore. He, he's frustrated. He's tired. He lost his five kids. He lost five of his children. He loved those kids. Now, Mariah, on the other hand, because she was already, watch this, she was already given to prayer. And she would pray fervently, regularly. What she did after the loss of her uh, loss of five kids, right? They still had one child left, left. But after the loss of five children to a terrible disease, she just kept praying. It pushed her deeper into prayer. Again, again, the revivalists, they have this great faith it, that, that pushes them closer to God. And so she's praying to God and, and she wants answers from God. God, my life is falling apart. God, my children are... My, my children have passed away. What, what's, going, what's going on? She wants answers from God for the life that she's living right now that has brought about incredible loss to her. And as she's doing this, she's also reading the scripture. And she comes across the prophecy, right? What Joel prophesied. Where, where the prophet Joel says, In the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters. Let me say that again. Your daughters. One more time. Your daughters will prophesy. They will be preachers. They will speak forth the word of God. She reads that and she feels like the Bible is condemning her. She literally says that there's a quote of her saying, I wish I, could, I wish I had it pulled up here for you, but there's a quote of her saying that I felt condemned as I read the Bible and I found that I was without excuse that she saw in the Bible powerful women. She saw people speaking on behalf of God that were women. And she recognized that I have to do what God is telling me to do. And so as she's, as she's reading the Bible, she's just being pounded by Scripture, affirming her call. And God's reminding her of what he told her to do when she was young, but she didn't listen. And not only that, as she's in, in fervent prayer, as she's seeking out God daily, constantly going in, all of a sudden she gets the vision. She says that two angels, not two angels, but angels came and visited her. I don't think she gave a, you know, a specific number. But she says angels came and visited her. And it was in a vision. And they begin to, to take her throughout the United States. And they took her out west. And she was going over prairies and different land and 
di different springs. She, she was going over all these different places. And then all of a sudden she sees this huge field of golden grain. And all of a sudden this grain, it falls like sheaves, she said. And the Lord spoke to her how that would happen. That when she would begin to speak, people would fall out in the spirit. Just from her speaking. All right? And so she has that, that vision. But then she's still struggling. She's still struggling. Listen to me. She's struggling because she has, I think she called it, you know, we call it the fear of man, but she, I think she called it like man's fear or something like that. She struggled with the idea of speaking in front of people. She struggled with the idea of being a woman who's going to speak. She struggled with the idea of, of, of having people not like her. And the revivalists, they've got to get that out of their system. If you're going to be a revivalist for God, if you're going to stir things up in the spirit realm, you have to get the fear of man out of you. You have to get out that sense of people pleasing. I love what God told Jeremiah. God tells Jeremiah, you look this up in your Bible. I've been stuck in Jeremiah chapter 1 for a while now. And I keep going back to it throughout my week. And one of the things that God tells Jeremiah is to not worry about their hostile faces. Look it up. That Jeremiah doesn't want to speak. He says, I'm young. And God tells him, don't worry about their faces. Don't worry about their faces. In other words, don't worry about how they look at you, how they view you, how they might shame you because of the things that you're saying. We tend to think, listen to me, we really got this, I don't know how to say it, we really got this twisted in the 21st century. We think that all preaching, if it makes us, you know, if it makes us uncomfortable in any way, then it must not be of God. If it challenges us, we don't want to hear it, right? We think that all preaching nowadays has to always be this hyper encouragement, just sort of point me in this direction. Don't talk about anything that's too hard, you know. But but when you look in the Bible, and even particularly, listen, we're going to see this with the revivalists. God would, would tell people in the Bible and the revivalists that we're going to talk about to say things that would challenge people. To do things that would shake people up. And so here is Mariah Woodworth Eder, and she's struggling with the concept of standing before people and preaching. Now, mind you, right, she, she's had a great loss in her life. Father has died. She's married to a man that, I guess, sort of loves God. Not really. Not, no desire for ministry. Five of her children, five of the six children have died. Her health isn't that good. And she's seeking God for answers. Her husband is now like a bump on a log, right? He's just sort of sitting around depressed, sad about life. He can't recover from the thought of losing five children. And she's seeking God. And God reminds her that she's supposed to be his preacher. She's supposed to be doing ministry. He gives her a dream about, you know, gives her a vision from these angels visiting her, taking her out west and her her preaching, she said she was preaching everywhere. She went over all these fields and prairies, and then she saw golden grain that, that fell down like sheaves, right? And then she has another vision, and this is what God gives her because she's afraid of, of people. God shows her a vision of people. It's like the way she describes it is that people are just falling into a into a, the abyss. That They're walking into a hole, and they don't even see it. And so she sees these people falling down in, into a terrifying hole, and then, they're, and then they're in hell. And so she has two visions. This one where angel, angels take her out west, and she sees this grain that falls to the ground. And then she has another vision of these people falling into, uh, falling into an abyss and going into hell. And she felt terrible. She, she was terrified by that because she recognized no one was telling these people that they're falling into a hole and ending up into hell. And so Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 1, God says to Jeremiah this. He says, he says, in effect, speak what I tell you. And he says this, watch. He says, don't be terrified of them, Jeremiah, or I will terrify you. Look it up in your Bible. I don't have the verse, but it's chapter, chapter 1 of Jeremiah. He says, if you're terrified of the people, Jeremiah, I will terrify you. And that's what happened to Mariah. She had this ter terrible vision, this terrifying vision of people falling into a great abyss and going to hell. That because she, watch me, because she was terrified of the people, she didn't know how to speak. She was constantly saying to herself, and, and, and you look this up in her bio, she was constantly saying to herself that I don't have the right education. I didn't go to a school. 
And that didn't matter to God. He still wanted to use her. And so what ends up happening is because she's terrified of people, just like Jeremiah, just like he says to Jeremiah, he gives her this terrifying vision to let her know that she has to speak. And so she gets her step together. She finally decides, I'm going to do it. I'm going to try, God. I'm going to try. Again, this, I mean, just think about the gravity of this. Okay, I'm not going to go through it again. But the death surrounding her life, her own illness in her body, right? A husband that doesn't support her faith, right? All these things that have just surmounted on her. And God is saying, I know you're a woman living in a society that thinks women can't really speak, but I'm calling you to do this anyways. This woman is just straight up gangster for Jesus. I mean, this woman, are you hearing what I'm saying? Like, here are all these issues going on, and, and she finally musters up the courage to say, you know what, God, I am going to do this. I am going to, to, to speak on your behalf. Okay, you got to listen to me for a moment. I did not struggle with women preachers. I just, I, sim I simply don't. I believe in, in male leadership. I believe in male headship. I absolutely see that, see that in the Bible. But I definitely make room for a Deborah. Come on. I make room for someone who's able to follow the Spirit. And I think what's going on nowadays, listen to me, and I'm telling you this. I can hear this by the Spirit of, Spirit of God. God's raising up Deborahs right now. I'm telling you. He's, he, he's raising up uh, women that are supremely devoted to Jesus and, and, and they're going to have the ability to speak and the ability to break chains and all those types of things, to, to break the yoke. And I'm telling you, if we don't make room for Deborah, we're miss one of God's gifts. We're miss what God's trying to do on, on the earth. And so when we look at the Bible, listen to me. The, the Bible talks about how there's no longer, right, Jew or Gentile. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or female. For all have become one in Christ Jesus. That when we look at when it comes to the spirit realm, we got to understand that the devil's not afraid of the man or woman you are. You are. He's afraid of the spirit you are. Let me say that one more time. The devil is not afraid of the man or the woman you are. He's afraid of the spirit you are. He's not afraid of, of, of your body, whether it's a manly body or a womanly body. He's afraid of your spirit. And if a woman has a spirit that is yielded to God, then, then she has the ability to speak in such a way to have an impact where she's at. And so I challenge people all the time when they say women can't be preachers or women can't be pastors. Okay, well, what about Ephesians 4? Because there aren't just pastors. There are, there are, can they be apostles? You, you say a woman can't be a pastor, but can, can she be an apostle? What about an evangelist? What, what about a teacher? What about a prophet? What about the prophetess Anna in the Bible? Come on, y'all. What about Phoebe? She was a deacon. She had the role of, of, of a deacon. What is it? Philip's daughters were prophetess in the, in the New Testament. And so listen, I, I'm not talking about usurping the role of the man, but what I am saying is that there are room for Deborah's. And, and even the prophecy says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And so absolutely, there is headship. There's, there's leadership from, from men. God has designed the, the, the man to be the leader. But there's no doubt when you look at the Bible, there are places in scripture where you see women being able to speak up on behalf of God. And whether you like it or not, listen to me. Deborah was Israel's elder at one point. I'm just telling you, she was the leader. She was the ruler of Israel at one point. Now you can make whatever argument you want, but God did put her in, put her in that position. And so listen, I'm not talking about usurping male leadership. I'm not talking about doing that. What I am saying is that there are occasions where God brings a woman forth to speak on his behalf. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I, I, I'm not saying that, that, that there should be less men in leadership. No, no, no. Men need to fulfill that role. But I'm telling you, he still calls women to speak and to show leadership in certain areas at certain times. And so here's what I'll say, because some of you will be mad at me no matter what. If you're like watching me in the cut, watching me in the replay, oh, that's not biblical. Listen, listen to me. Here, here, here's, here's what I'm saying, is that it's not normative, but it is narrative. And I want to sit here for a moment. It's not normative, but it is narrative. That there are some things that are normative. You see men being called to leadership, men, men being called to that standard. Absolutely. Talking about an elder being, being, being the husband of, of one wife. Absolutely. Right? 
how, how the Bible talks about women being silent in church. I, absolutely, we, we, we see that. I, 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 don't, I don't deny that, right? That's what's normative. Male le leadership is normative. But then there are some narratives where women do lead. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's the difference that, that I'm making. And so there are some narratives in which these things do happen. And when we see it, baby, we need to see God in it. And so I won't say anything else about that. But the reality is, is that God did call Mariah Woodworth Edder. And what held her back for so long was the fact that she was a woman. And God had to show her that, that in the scripture it says, In the last days, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters will, will, will prophesy. And so, Mariah, she begins to do this. She makes the decision. And she makes the decision to say, hey, hey I'm going to be a preacher. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to start some meetings. And so the first place she starts is in her hometown. All right? She starts in her hometown. The majority of the people that are there are her relatives. And then she has a few outsiders. And what begins to happen is that when she preaches at this particular meeting that she's hosting, is that all of a sudden, what she saw in the vision takes place. She's preaching, and the next thing you know, people start weeping, and they fall on the floor. That the grain that she saw in that first vision from those angels, that the grain became like sheaves and it fell to the ground, right? That happens, that she would just be preaching, and all of a sudden, people would start weeping and fall out in the spirit. This first meeting that she had, it's recorded that people started weeping, and some even ran out of the house, that people just... They were so moved by the spirit. They were so overwhelmed, so convicted that they just ran out of the house in tears while others fell on the ground, fell out in the spirit while weeping. Do you see what I'm saying? And so her, so the vision begins to take place. And then watch this. Once she started preaching, once she started having revival meetings at different locations, her health started to get better. Her health started to get better. <laughs> and so listen, this is the mark of her ministry though. When you look up when you look up Mariah Woodworth Edder, the mark of her ministry, what people know the most about her is the trances and visions that people would get into. That even Mariah she would get in, into trances for days. She would get in trances for hours to where she would be, just be looking and like her eyes are open but she's just gone. She's caught up into the heavens. She's caught up into the spirit of God. She's just caught up and so she was known for that. And that's what would happen at her meetings. That some people, there, there's a story of someone showing up to her meeting. And she, th this particular individual was very staunch, was very religious. And this person didn't believe it. However, all of a sudden the power of God hit, hit. And this woman stood in the meeting for two hours in a trance. And when, and when this person came to, she saw all these heavenly things. And it caused her, watch, to repent and come to God. And so, where is this in the Bible? Where do we see trances or visions in the Bible? That's an excellent question. Acts chapter 10. Let me show you. Let me show you. Acts chapter 10. Because when you hear about these things, you know, you, you, you see people fall out in the spirit. You hear about visions and you ask yourself, is that even biblical? There's so many things that people say nowadays. There's so many things on social media. Well, I had a vision. I had a vision. I mean, there are things that God shows me that I honestly just don't tell people. Because there's so much of that nowadays. People come online, I had a vision, I saw this, da da da, da. And, and it's just, you know, so much stuff that we wonder, is it true? Is it even biblical? Let me show you Acts chapter 10, starting at verse 9. Listen to this. Acts 10, verse 9. Someone put that in the chat. Acts 10, starting at verse 9. Thank you, Jill. About noon, the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on, on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, watch this, he fell into a trance. While the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open. And something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. And so we should know this story. This is when Peter gets the revelation. He's in a trance and he gets this revelation that the gospel is for the Gentiles. And so there we have it right there. He gets into a trance. He gets into a vision. And he and watch this. He was, he was just hungry. He was just hungry. He's trying to prepare a meal. 
And all of a sudden, he falls into a trance. And this would be the mark of her ministry. She would be preaching, and all of a sudden, somebody over here would, would be in a trance. Somebody would fall in the spirit. They'd come back, and they would say, oh my gosh, I saw myself in hell, and I need to repent quickly. Oh my gosh, I saw God doing this. Like, out of nowhere, that's what would happen. The vision she had came true, that she would go, she would travel out west, she would travel not only there, but just all over the place, and and, and these grains would fall like sheaves. They would just fall out. And that's what would happen. She's traveling. She's doing different meetings. And out of nowhere, people are caught up in trances, uh, visions, right? Um, all, all, all that stuff. And they're, and they're having these great visions of, of heaven and hell. And they have to make a decision. And so she became known for that. Even when you look at John, John, John the Revelator in the book of Revelation, right? Revelation chapter 1, it talks about, John says, when I saw him, it could be verse 17. I, I, I might be off, but Revelation, somebody look that up for me. Somebody, somebody look that up for me. It's, it's Revelation chapter 1. I'm not sure what verse it is, but John, it, it might be Revelation 1, 17. John looks up and when he sees God, when he sees Jesus, he says he falls to the ground like a dead man. Like a dead man. And he was frightened. And all of a sudden, God had to come touch him and, and, and say, it's okay, right? Look, look that up. It's, some, it's somewhere in there, okay? But he fell. He, he has this vision of God, and then he falls to the ground. He falls out in the spirit. Even you go to John chapter 18, verse 6. Is it Revelation 117? That's right, Revelation 117. Good job, Brian. But you go to John 18, verse 6. When the Roman soldiers come to apprehend Jesus, and they're looking for him. Where is this Jesus? Jesus shows up and he says, I am he. And the Bible says that the Roman soldiers, they drew back and they fell to the ground. Now, we don't know, I don't know how many soldiers were there. I'm not, I'm not sure how, how many were there. But those soldiers fell to the ground at the presence of Jesus. Jesus. And this actually happened at one of her meetings. That Mariah, she's in a meeting. And what ends up happening is, while she's there, a man comes in, and she goes to shake his hand. And as she's about to shake his hand, the man, he falls to the ground and ends up in a trance. And so this actually made Mariah nervous because she recognized that because of the anointing that was on her, that when she would get next to people, that sometimes they would just sort of fall out in the spirit. That, that it was not only happening at various locations, spots in her meetings, just people falling out and getting into trances, visions, but if she touched somebody, it would happen sometimes. And so what she did was she, she determined in her mind that she would stay on the platform because it made her a little bit nervous that if she gets too close to somebody, th they might fall into a trance. They might fall out in the spirit. And so she, one story is recorded to where she decides to stay on the platform and she's at another minister's church preaching and she, she goes up on the platform, doesn't want to be around the people. And the minister, the, the, the lead pastor that's sitting on the stage with her, the moment he gets next to her, he falls out. He just falls out in the spirit on the ground, and he's in a trance now. And he comes to, and he has all these visions that, of what God wants to do and, 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 and how people need to be saved in this room. And so understand, what was happening, listen to me, at these meetings with Moriah, what was happening is that people would get, would get caught up in a trance, in a vision. They would fall in the spirit. And oftentimes, these people would see themselves in hell. They would get up and repent quickly. And so it was about salvation. It was about the gospel that God's spirit was working in such a way that he was revealing to them that they were hellbound, that they were far from him. And so this wasn't just, okay, we're having trances, we're having vi visions for the sake of having them. No, God was really touching people. God was really moving upon people. And again, she was known, Mariah and all these revivals, I can, I can say this for every revivalist we're going to cover over the next several weeks, they're known for prayer. She would sometimes get five people together and pray and pray and pray for the meeting. Pray and pray and pray. And so there are stories recorded that when she would go to a city or, or a town and do a meeting, that just because she was in the area, people would fall out all over the city. Now, whether you believe this or not, this is what's been recorded. People would be at their jobs. They fall, they fall, they fall out in the spirit or get caught up in a, tra a trance. They'd be walking around the town in the city. And just because Mariah was in the city, all of a sudden they get caught up in a trance and they would see that they were in hell and they would want to repent. They would want to come to the meeting and, and give their lives to Jesus. Do you see, isn't that incredible? And so that's what she became really known for. At one time when she's, when she's heading out more like towards uh, 
more Western Ohio and she's preaching. She's 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 preaching and all of a sudden 15 men and women 15 men and women come running towards the altar screaming. They're literally screaming and they're asking for Jesus. They all fall into a trance. They see themselves far from God, away from God, and they repent, give, giving their lives to Jesus. This is what happened regularly. People falling out in the spirit, people having trances, all those things. She would even get high profile, pro, pro, high profile doctors that, I forget the number, but there were several doctors that were come to her meeting. And one doctor, he came to his meeting and he didn't believe it. He didn't believe that people were really getting into trances and that people were, would, would, were, you know, really getting into the spirit, having these visions, right? And so he shows up. And actually what would happen later, unfortunately, with every original, there's a counterfeit, right? Um, and so unfortunately, people do begin to fake this down the road, right? You get people that fake the, the original move of God. But this was legit. And so this doctor shows up and he says, you know, he says to himself, I'm not sure this is real. I'm just here to investigate this. And this is a house meeting now. She's actually in a house at this time. And this doctor, he's walking around the house. There's lots of preaching, right? Everyone's crowded in this house. He goes to one particular part of the house and he sees his son. He had no idea his son was going to be there. And his son is on the ground crying out to God. And then all of a sudden, this doctor, he's, he looks at his son. He says, what are you, what are you doing here? And his son, his son grabs him and says, God, he says, he says, dad, will you pray for me? Pray for me. I need to know Jesus. And then all of a sudden the father ends up falling out and he had, and he's in a trance. Like <laughs> here is this high profile doc, pro, profile doctor. He doesn't believe what's going on. He shows up and he cannot believe, listen, he cannot believe that his son is there. He's shocked by it. And then when his son asks him to pray for him, he can't do it. But all of a sudden he gets hit by the power of power of God. He gets, in, gets into a trance, and then he gives his life to Jesus. And so there were lots of doctors that would show up to see if this was real. And this particular doctor that showed up, he, in, his, in his trance, he saw himself in hell. He saw himself far from God, and he gave his life to Christ. And so that was the thing. People would show up to the meetings. And just like, again, this is biblical. Paul talks about a man who was caught up to the third heaven. And he says, now what, whether he's in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But he was up there. And this was happening. Why can't we just believe the Bible? Why is it that Peter can go into a trance while he's trying to eat, right? Why is it that Paul can talk about people being caught up in the third heaven? Why is it that Isaiah can have a, have a trance, a vision in, in Isaiah chapter 6 of, of, of the throne room of God? Ezekiel, he's also caught up in visions. Why, why do we have this happening in the Old and New Testament? And then people talk about it today and it seems like it's strange. Do you see what I'm saying? And so this is like the identifiable thing of Mariah Woodworth Eder, these trances, these visions that she would get into and other people would get into. And they would often repent after seeing themselves in hell. All right. And so she's now full blown. She's a full blown evangelist. She's, she's going from meeting to meeting, town to town. Some of them are churches. Some of them are house meetings. Some of them are tent revivals. Full-blown evangelist. And one of the things that would become markers for her meetings was also violence. She had a lot of violent meetings. I mean, goodness. Uh, people were really against her. Now, look at this woman. Why would you want to be against this woman? Here's a picture of her. Now, it's, it's you know, not the best quality, but to give you an idea of her, she looks like a woman that would bake you cookies. Like, she looks like a nice lady. This is not the woman you would want to bully. This is not the woman you want to mess with. It almost seems like it's just a terrible thing to go after a lady like this. But at her meetings, there was a lot of, of, of violence because she was known for going into cold, dry, religious places, places that no other preachers were successful at. Particularly if you look it up, if you were to look up, I'm not going to go into it, but if you were to look up St. Louis and the violence that she encountered there. I mean, there were gang members showing up to her meetings when, when she was at St. Louis. But people would come against her. I mean, there are stories of, of people planting bombs in her meetings, but those bombs wouldn't even go off. Gang members showing up, threatening her with clubs, right? Uh, clubs, bats, those types of things. Uh, she would get weekly death threats. The news would, would, would slander her. 
uh, other ministers were against her. She went to jail four times. Four times she went to jail. Listen, listen to me. Four times. One time she's in California and she's doing a big tent revival and the police were upset with her. They were upset with her because she was drawing people by the thousands. I mean, she, you know, she, when, when you have somebody that's drawn such a big crowd, police and communities might get nervous because that might mean trouble. You know, is this going to be like a riot type thing? What, what's really going on? And so she's in California and the police don't like her. And so there's a story of drunken police that show up to her tent in California and they show up with the intent to, to, to disperse her meeting just to show up and, and to scare her and to stop her for, from doing this because they don't like her in California. This is causing too much trouble. It's causing too much of a stir. And so there are a few police officers that are in, that are in her meeting, but they're not doing anything just yet. And Mariah Woodworth Edder, she knew this was going on. She knew that the police were going to try to stampede the place that night and try to just disrupt everybody. Okay. And so what happens is she comes out on the platform and she preaches boldly that even though she was warned that the police were here tonight and some of them are drunken police officers, they're tired of you being here. They're tired of all the crowds. It's causing them to work more, all, all that type of stuff. Even though she knew that the, it, it, the story is she comes out boldly and she preaches the gospel hard and the anointing fills the area underneath the tent, so much so that the police get frightened. They can't even, some of the, the police just run out because they can sense the power of God. They can sense the anointing. They don't even disrupt it. They decide to leave and go home, right? And so she was known for her boldness. She, fight, she frightened the police because, listen, there was anointing behind her preaching. And again, listen, what, what did I say at the beginning? The anointing breaks the yoke. The, listen, this isn't just angel angel feathers and, and oil coming out of hands now, right? This is when, when you preach in such a way that people only have one option. They're going to, they're going to repent or they're going to go. I love, listen, I love preaching like that. I love preaching where, where there's a demand, where you have to make a choice, where someone's standing up for something, where, where, where there's sweat. Something happened in the 21st century type preaching to where it's always just a bunch of bunch of giggle fits. It's always just watered down. It's always gimmicky. It's just about you're going to have your season. You're, listen, this is life and death. Mariah Woodworth Edder understood that. She would preach the gospel. She would preach the gospel boldly to everyone that was there. At one point, listen, at one point, I forget where this is at, but at one point in one of her meetings, there's a man that shows up and he's ticked off about her because again, she's a woman preaching and she preaches with authority. You would often find her preaching and, and singing for some reason, revivalists, they tend to sing a lot, you know, not all of them, but they, they love to sing and, and they love to get into the presence of God and, and preach out of that presence. And so a man shows up. Because he's just tired of, of hearing about this woman preaching with boldness. And he thinks, he thinks that he's going to put her in her place. So, he, so he's, he's charging the platform. <laughs> I love this. As he's charging the platform, Mariah Woodworth Edder is undaunted. She's unmoved. And as he comes to the platform, he points his finger, finger and he's getting ready to cuss her out. The Holy Spirit closes his mouth. He's literally at the platform going, mm, 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 and, he, and he can't talk. He can't get out what he wants to get out because the Holy Spirit just utterly stops the man. And so there were just violent outbursts. There were, there are stories of, of people bringing like people that were mentally disturbed to her meetings on purpose. Like people that have some serious mental illness because, because they thought that they would disrupt the environment, but she just kept on preaching. And so she would go into hard places Particularly St. Louis was a place that no minister had been successful at, but she was successful in spite of threats of death and all that stuff. She was successful because she kept praying and she stood it out and she wasn't afraid. And so even when the game bangers would show up, she, she stayed right there in St. Louis. So, so look that up. That's real, that's, it's real powerful what she did there. And so there were violent times at her meetings just because, again, when you are a revivalist, you draw antagonists. 
You draw people that are against you. You really are pushing the kingdom of God forward. The devil doesn't like that. This isn't just pat me on the back Christianity. This isn't just tell me I'm a great person Christianity. This isn't the macaroni and cheese snack pack Christianity that we become accustomed to. To where we're just trying to build campuses. We're just trying to have nice white teeth. And we're just trying to be saved enough to go to heaven. No. Hell was real. And she understood that she had to preach against the kingdom of darkness. She understood that she had to be persistent. And so she had a lot of challenge. At, at, at her meetings. And so she, she's still doing meetings and, and what have you. She's moving from, from city to city. She has, some, she has some traction. She has some followers. People are really interested in what's going on. And she's not trying... Understand, these, these, these trances, these moves of the Holy Spirit, she's not trying to make them happen. They're just happening. And then God begins to speak to her about healing. Now, at first... She wasn't into healing. She didn't, want to, she didn't want to step into the healing ministry because she had such an evangelistic call. And watch this. I love this about her. Her heart was so much for souls being saved that she loved the fact that people would go into trances because the Holy Spirit was doing it. They come out of them because they saw themselves in hell and they would repent and turn to Jesus. And she didn't want that ruined. She didn't want that ruined. She loved showing up and just being available to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would, would, would slain people, would bring them into trances and, and visions, and, and people would, would repent. She loved that. She didn't want to disrupt that. But the Holy Spirit began to speak to her about laying hands on the sick so that people can be healed. She wasn't, but, but she wasn't searching to do that. And so she, she, she listened, and she has a bunch of notable, notable healings in her meetings. Once she started doing that, it just started happening. Uh, people of tuberculosis were healed. Cancers were healed. Uh, one meeting in Dallas, there's a man that showed up and his ribs were were broken. He had three ribs that were broken. And she places her hands on his ribs and immediately he flinches. And then everybody, everybody heard, snap, 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 pop, pop, pop. The, the ribs pop back into place and he just rejoices over what God has done in his life. And so she had she had great, great healing uh, great miracles in, in, in her meetings. But again, she wasn't looking for healing ministry. She just wanted to be available to the Holy Spirit and watch what the Holy Spirit w would do. And so let's just jump out of her ministry for a moment. Let's talk about her life again, her personal life, because we talked about her husband, right? Her, her husband, Mr. Woodworth, he wasn't really into God. He wasn't really into ministry, anything like that. And guess what he ends up doing? In the midst of her growing and becoming who she's supposed to be, her husband commits infidelity. And so they don't get a divorce right away. And of course, that's, that's grounds for divorce. God is not someone who encourages divorce. But biblically speaking, you can get a divorce when someone cheats on you. Now, the greater thing to do is to forgive, right? However, yes, when someone, when someone cheats on you, when, when there's an infidelity, there is room because that covenant has been broken, right? For you to move on and so what ends up happening is they stay together for a little while longer they're, they're 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 together for a few more years however she's not really connected to him anymore she's she's sleeping in a different part of the house because she's been hurt uh he he cheated on her they're not really connected anyways and so shortly after a few years of of really not being connected they just get to the, get the divorce all right and so she does keep her she does keep her name though and down the road, she marries a man by the name of Samuel Etter. All right. Hence, we had Woodworth Etter. She marries a man by the name of Samuel Etter. And this is like somebody that she just adores. Samuel gets her. Samuel wants to, wants to help her out in ministry. Uh, Samuel helps her with the administrative things of her ministry. He helps write her books. She, she's actually published six books. You can go to Amazon. I'm not sure if they're all on there. But you can find her books. One of her most notable books is called Signs, Wonders, and Miracles. I think, I think that's what it's called, Signs, Wonders, and Miracles. That's the book that people tend to refer to with her ministry. So I, I think it was like six bucks on Amazon. I could be wrong. I could be wrong there. But you can go to Amazon and look up her book, her, her book on Signs, Wonders, and Miracles. So she published six books. Her husband, Samuel, was very instrumental in those books, editing them. Uh, all, all those things for her. And so she really loved that man. He was good to her. Um, he, he, he loved God. And it was a nice, it was a nice tag team. It was a nice relationship for her, uh, for her, for her and him. Eventually, some years down the road, 
uh, he dies, right? So she's a widower. She, she's a widower now. Um, she's a widow. And so her life has really been full, really been full after 45 years of ministry. And I mean, just think about her life, okay? We didn't get into everything uh, because I don't want to be on here forever. And I, oh my goodness, I've already been on here an hour, almost an hour and 30 minutes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, her life is full from what she, I mean, she really had some tragedies, some, some real losses. And again, just look at this woman. This woman's a powerhouse. This woman is bold. This woman knew how to stand up in her time and say, look, God really did call me. God, God really called me for such, for such a time as this, right? And, you know, she's had losses. She's lost her some of her children, um, both her husband hu husbands, right? W one of them had infidelity, cheated, and he eventually died. And as a matter of fact, her, her first hu husband, uh, Mr. Woodworth, after they split, he he blasphemed her. Like he talked bad about her and her ministry. And it's noted that he didn't live much longer after that. That once the divorce happened and he spoke against her and started to come against her ministry, that many people say that he didn't live a long life after that because of how he spoke against Mariah. And so even though they had a bad split, there was a divorce, There is a, it is recorded that she did go to his funeral that she did attend his funeral and, and, and even that she even uh, officiated some of it. She even did some of the, the programming for it for her, for her ex-husband. And so Mr. Woodworth died, Mr. Eddard died. I mean, just a full life. And so after 45 years of ministry, 45 years of serving the Lord through hard times, lean times, all sorts of different things happening in her life, she decides that she wants to settle down in ministry. So what she does, she founds she founds a church. She, she's a founder of a church called the Tabernacle, and she did it in Indiana. All right. So in Indiana, she she's the founder of a church called the Tabernacle, and she loved she loved it there. She loved being there. She's she's older at this point now. She spent the last six years, the last six years of her life, at the church that she founded, and she even had an influence. Watch this. She had an influence on Amy Simple McPherson. Now I don't know if you heard of her. Um, but Amy Simple McFish, McPherson, and we're, we're talking about her down the road, but she really had a longing to meet Mariah, you know, and it's in her diary somewhere, a Amy Simple McPherson, of her talking about how she had the opportunity to meet her and how great that was. And so it's believed that, that Mariah had an influence on Amy's ministry. However, uh, Mariah struggled with Amy's ministry because Amy was more into like the dramatics and more like into the, the arts and really dramatic in her speaking really sort of showy. And Mariah didn't like that about Amy because Mariah is very much in the holiness. And she, many people consider her like one of the mothers of the holiness movement and the Pentecostal movement. And so Mariah was very straight lace forward. And then here comes Amy Simple McPherson and she's very dramatic and glamorous in her presentation of the gospel. And so, and so Amy Simple McPherson was inspired by Mariah, but Mariah didn't really agree with her too much. And it's even said, now no one knows this for sure, but it's even said that Mariah had influence on Smith Wigglesworth because People have noticed that a lot of the things that Smith Wigglesworth said, some of them are quotes from Mariah, some of the things that Mariah would say. And so no one knows that for sure, but because of some of the things that Smith Wigglesworth would say, many people have equated that perhaps he was a disciple to some degree of Mariah Woodworth Eder. Isn't that powerful? I mean, isn't that, I mean, one of the most, probably the most notable revivalist, Smith Wigglesworth, could have potentially been a disciple, a student of Mariah Woodworth Eder. It's just powerful. And so Amy Simple McPherson, she would show up to the to the tabernacle, her church in Indiana, and you'd be glad to, to meet her, spend time with Mariah, even though they had some differences. And what would end up happening is, as she ministered there for the last six years of her life, she grew really weak, she grew really tired, and not because of any sin or anything like that, just because she got older. And here's the story, okay? The story is, is that she got to the point in her life, Mariah, where she couldn't really walk well anymore she, she was just weak she was tired she was coming to the end of her life she even knew like god told her that her that her life was coming to an end and she would talk to people about it and so what would happen is she would have some strong men 
come to her house because her house was right next to the tabernacle, the church that she founded. They would come to her house and they and they created this like nice big wooden chair for her. And she would sit down in that wooden chair and these strong guys would pick up that chair, take her to the church. All right? And then here's what's interesting. It's recorded that when she would stand up out of that chair, all of a sudden the power of God would hit her and she would be pacing back and forth real fast and strong. It's like she was young again. That all of a sudden when she hit that platform and she started preaching at her church, it's like she was a young woman all over again. She wasn't old. She wasn't feeble anymore. Uh, the power of God was there. But then all of a sudden when she was done preaching, she would sit back down in that chair and she was weak again. <laughs> that is incredible. That the anointing was so strong that even in her old age, even though she was feeble, when, when she decided to stand up and speak on behalf of, of God, the anointing would carry her. And if I want to leave you with anything tonight, it's that. The anointing will carry you. The anointing will push you. The anointing will, will keep you. But listen, you have to be a person of prayer. You have to be a person of prayer. We've been duped, y'all. I know it's like, why does Brian have to say these things? Because it's the truth. We've been duped in believing that we can do ministry without prayer. We can do ministry. We can do whatever we, we want. We can go to any city we want. We can go to any area. Remind you that Mariah, she had a vision from God of the areas that she would go and minister to. You would go out west and then you would go from coast to coast, all this stuff. There's more you got to read about her. But we got to understand that prayer, the anointing, fasting, really loving Jesus, not just doing ministry for Jesus, is what really changes people's lives. You shouldn't have to have a sign that says, come over here, I'm going to help you, or come to this spot over here. People should get around you. Think about your phone conversations. Come on, the people you talk to on, on a regular basis, your, your, your co-workers, maybe your employees, people that you see at the bank, do they sense anointing coming off of you? Do they sense that you've been in prayer? Or, or do you only turn it on when there's events where, you see what I'm saying, where there, where there are Christian events? Mariah Woodworth Eder and all these revivalists that, that are going to follow after her, they have this incredible prayer life and incredible anointing that follows it. And so, just an incredible woman of God with what she was able to do. I'm going to read to you and then I'll close it. A man by the name of Robert Lairdon, he writes a bio on Mariah Woodworth Eder, and I like what he says about her life. Let me, let, me, let me read it to you. Before Sister Eder went home to be with the Lord at age 80, she had buried all six of her children and two husbands, preached thousands of sermons from coast to coast, remained the victor over hoodlums and vicious ministers, Blaze the trail for women in ministry and unflinchingly displayed the power of the Holy Spirit with many signs and wonders following. She wasn't well educated. She didn't care about seminary classes and didn't take the time to explain how God worked. She preached a very simple gospel, offered herself completely to him and believed for signs and wonders. Maria's one passion was for the gospel to come alive and for people to be led by the Spirit. She preached many times with tears streaming down her face, begging those who heard to come to Christ. Her meetings and teachings paved the way for the founding of many Pentecostal denominations, including the Assemblies of God, Foursquare, and other similar denominations. And so again, this was a powerhouse of a woman, marked by the Holy Spirit. Some people, she's known as, it, the nickname that people give her is the demonstrator of the Spirit, Right? That, she, that wherever she went, the Spirit was just able to do things. She was a portal. She was an, she was an altar for the Holy Spirit to work. And I hope that we are all that way. That we all get to the place to where we see ourselves as portals, altars for, altars for the Holy Spirit to work and then do what He really wants to do. And so there she is, Mariah Woodworth Eder. She was a powerhouse for the kingdom. I hope you're motivated by her. And I'm telling you, there's somebody out there listening to me. And you have the same spirit. You have the same spirit. And you can't let anything hold you back. Mariah Woodworth Eder, she didn't let her husband hold her back. Come on, that even though even though she, her first husband, he wasn't really into God, he wasn't really supportive of the ministry, she still became a powerhouse. That even though she was a woman in a society that told her she couldn't preach, she couldn't even vote, she, she still did what God told her to do. Even though she had moments where she was afraid of people, she still spoke boldly on behalf of of God. Look at her, y'all. She's not very intimidating. 
but the spirit that she has was very intimidating to the kingdom of darkness. And so I'm talking to that person out there, that Mariah that's listening to me. Don't let anybody hold you back from what God has told you to do. All right? Talk to ministry leaders. Talk to your pastor. Uh, read some books, right? Ask somebody to help you with, with your ministry. Be blessed, everybody. Keep it gangster for Jesus.